Welcome to study two in the series, The Church That Jesus Wants. Jesus wants his church back. And the study that we're going to look at today in number two is looking at from Babylon to Jerusalem, from darkness to light. What sort of church does Jesus want? And this is going to be a fascinating study in the things that Jesus wants to reveal about the church that he wants. In the book of Revelation, we saw that John sees 3,000 years of history. And he sees from his age of uh, around 100 AD, coming through to uh, the end of this 2,000 year period of time, the age of the Holy Spirit. And we're coming to the end of that age right now. We're in 2021 and, and maybe uh, we have 10, 20, 30, 40 years left. We know the time is getting very close. We know that there can be errors in calendars. We know that uh, people have tried to make calculations and predictions. We know that the time is close because the Bible says we are not ignorant of the times and the seasons. But of the day and the hour, we don't know because that's in the Father's hands. However, we're getting very close to that end time. And because of that, we know that God is going to do something special in these last days and we want to be a part of it. We also looked at John's two visions, as you can see in this diagram. He saw one vision looking back to the past. As it says in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said to him, write the things which you have seen, which are and which are to come. So past, present and future. But in his second vision, he was to see the church of the future. In Revelation 1 to 3, he sees the mess that man made of the church. He sees how the church has gone uh, uh, well, almost into apostasy. Jesus has been kicked out of the church by the seventh church in Laodicea. He's outside. He wants to get in. He wants his church back. But the church says, we're lacking nothing. Well, they were lacking something. They were lacking Jesus. And in Revelation 4 to 5, John gets a second vision. But he had to change direction, as we saw. He had to look into what God was wanting to reveal in our day and age. In Revelation 1.19, Jesus had said to John, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So this was a dividing time in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 2 and 3 tells us about the things which were in the past and which are at the present. But then in Revelation 4, we transition to the church in the future. So in the second vision that he has, he is now looking into the future and looking at what is going to transpire over the next 3,000 years um, of time. As we saw in Revelation 4 and verse 1 in the last study, after these things, that's after the mess that man had made of the church, after Jesus had come and rebuked them and called them to repentance, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So what happens in the future? Well, we're going to find that there's two women, two churches, two mysteries. The first one is the mystery of iniquity. And we're going to see it has its consummation uh, in, in Babylon. The second one, the mystery of godliness. And it will have its consummation in the body of Christ being revealed as the glorious church, the bride of Christ. What a wonderful revelation 
that we might be a part of this church that Jesus wants. Well, in this first study, we look at Mystery Babylon. The mystery of iniquity. And in Revelation 17, verses 1 to 7, we read, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlots. In fact, there's two women. We're going to see in Revelation 17, the consummation of the mystery of iniquity is Babylon, the great harlots. The consummation of the mystery of godliness, Revelation 12, is the glorious woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and the stars, the bride of Christ. But here in Revelation 17, it says, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, she's in the wilderness, just like the woman of Revelation 12 also goes out into the wilderness. But Mystery Babylon says, I saw a woman, this Mystery Babylon, sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Verse 7. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. This is the bride of Antichrist. The Antichrist is that beast that carries her. And this woman, Babylon the Great, Mystery Babylon, is the bride of Antichrist. Satan is always trying to copy the things that, that God has done. Remember when Moses cast down his rod and it became uh, a serpent? And then the magicians, they did the same thing. But the power of God is greater than the power of Satan. And <laughs> the serpent of Moses devoured the serpents uh, that were fr from the magicians. And that's the way that the Bible reveals the greatness of God. He is greater, more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. Now in Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 to 5, we read a bit more about this mystery Babylon. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her wrath, um, of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich, through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. See, Mystery Babylon, the bride of the Antichrist, the mother of harlots, a persecutor of the church. But what was so shocking is that God said, come out of her, my people. Why were God's people in Babylon? They went down because of their compromising with the things that this world has to offer. We have to reject the things that this world has to offer, the darkness and the seductions of, of Satan. 
And he's wanting to bring the church under his thumb. He wants to control and destroy the church because he knows that a church that becomes like the church that Jesus wants will destroy the power of Satan and set free humanity to believe in Jesus Christ. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, that there's going to be a great falling away. It's already begun. And this is why you have many in the church going down to Babylon. Why on earth would they go down to Babylon? This great falling away in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You see, the truth will set you free. But doctrines of demons will bring you into captivity. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 3, we see some more about this great falling away. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal despisers of good. Verses 4 and 5 goes on to say, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. This is a church in compromise. Jesus wants his church back. We have to get back to the Bible. We have to get back to the word of God. We need to let Jesus be Lord in the midst of his church. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 2, it says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. See, there was a false doctrine that was saying that Jesus had already come. And Paul had to correct this false doctrine. So in verses 3 and 4, he goes on to say, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of the second coming of Christ, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that, that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, this actually goes back to the Old Testament when we read about the rebellion of Satan. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13, we see that Satan's rebellion is a rebellion of seeking to steal the glory of God. Isaiah 14, 13 says, You, Lucifer, have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. Now, the farther sides of the north, that's Mount Zion. The place of God's presence and his Shekinah glory. See in Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. In his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. See, the sides of the north that Satan wanted was the house of God that was filled with the glory of God. And Paul, he told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that the temple is not that building in Jerusalem. The true temple is the people of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 uh, says to us, Don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? 
If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. God is jealous for his church. His church is his temple. And this is where the glory of God is. See, we're not interested in the, the building of a third temple. If the Jews want to build a third temple, yeah, that's up to them. But Jesus, his church, his temple, is you and me, believers in Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians 2, 19 to 21, this is confirmed. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The church is the temple of the living God. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, when uh, it tells us that the Antichrist will come and stand in the temple, claiming to be God, that's not talking about a temple in Jerusalem. He wants to steal the glory of God. And the glory of God is in the church. That's what he wants to steal. Just like in Isaiah 14. We are the temple of the living God. We don't need a third temple. We don't want to go back under the law of Moses because that would be uh, to slander the name of Christ, humiliate the name of Christ, to reinstitute animal sacrifices. There is only one sacrifice for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. And his is a once-for-all offering. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, it says, The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with, his, uh, with the, mouth of the, uh, the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, the truth sets you free. But if you don't have a love of the truth, if you just want to go along with fancy theories, you're in trouble. We need to get back to the Bible. The Bible is the revelation of the heart of Jesus, and Jesus wants his church back, and he wants his people to understand his word. Now, this great falling away is also told to us in other passages of Scripture, like in Revelation 12 and verse 4. Here we find that Satan, he comes and he wants to destroy the church. Revelation 12 verse 4, his tail, T-A-I-L, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, the seed of Abraham were called the stars of heaven. That's the spiritual seed of Abraham. The natural seed, you know, that's like uh, the grains of sand by the seashore. But what is this tail, T-A-I-L, that draws a third of the stars of heaven? Well, Isaiah 9 verse 15 tells us, the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. See, the T-A-I-L is the T-A-L-E. It's his lie, his deception. And in this great falling away that's going to take place in the last days, we can see what's going to happen to three groups of Christians. Zechariah 13 verse 8 says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. Now, these two-thirds who, who are cut off and die, these are those who become apostate, backsliders who go beyond and they re-crucify Christ, totally rejecting Jesus, body, soul, and spirit. They re-crucify Christ under themselves. They're going to be 
become the followers of the Antichrist. The other one third of that two thirds are those Christians who are a bit wishy-washy. Oh yeah, they love Jesus, but they're not willing to take the full price, not willing to take up the cross, not willing to follow fully as a disciple of Jesus and to be the person that Jesus wants them to be. Two thirds will be cut off and die because the first third, they will be destroyed because they have taken the mark of the beast, the 666. The other third will die because they will be beheaded by the Antichrist for refusing to bow down and, and worship him. But then it tells us, but one third shall be left in it. Notice verse 9. I will bring the one third... This one third are the overcomers. These are those Christians who love and follow Jesus fully, totally, in total commitment. So what's happening? One third will become apostate and followers of the Antichrist, receiving the 666. One third, they're the lukewarm Christians, but they're going to have a wake-up call when the Great Tribulation comes, and they're going to have to uh, decide... Are they going to follow Jesus or follow the Antichrist? And by rejecting the Antichrist and deciding to follow Jesus, they will be beheaded. And through that, they will gain their victory and they will take their part in the first resurrection, as we're told in Revelation 20 and verse 4. But the other one third, the victorious, all-conquering Christians, those who are going to be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, I will bring the one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. So we see that in the end times, Christians are going to be divided into these three camps. One third will fall into the Antichrist deception, the great falling away. One third, the lukewarm Christians, fall into the Antichrist's reign, but they die for their faith. And one third, they will be the untouchable overcomer. Satan won't be able to touch them. They will be alive and remain until Jesus returns. But you see, it's that first and second group, those who get totally deceived and those who are lukewarm, who are in danger of going down to Babylon. In Revelation 18 verses 4 and 5, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to God, and God has remembered her iniquities. And in Revelation 21, 2 to 3, we now see the other woman, the other city, not the city Babylon, but the city of the New Jerusalem. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned uh, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now remember John, he had two visions. He saw 3,000 years of history. He was told, write the things which have been, which are and which are to come. And then told specifically, I will show you the things which must take place after this. In other words, after the first century. And for the next 3,000 years to the return of Christ and then the millennium and the revelation of God's glory. And this is why we see these two mysteries. You see, the, the first mystery which we looked at, the mystery of iniquity, which ends up in Babylon, ends up, the bride of uh, the Antichrist. And this is a terrible disaster. And the church is called, come out from amongst her. Have no part of her. But God is calling us into the second mystery, the mystery of godliness. That first mystery, 
Babylon, just like the Tower of Babel uh, that we read about in the book of Genesis with Nimrod. It was a symbol of rebellion against God. But the second mystery, this is the mystery of godliness, of the glory of God revealed in his church, having a church full of perfection and righteousness and holiness without spot or blemish, a sinless, glorious church as a bride for Christ. What a wonderful revelation. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17, we see that there is a group of people who are going to be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see, the dead in Christ must rise first. Now that includes all of those tribulation saints who are martyred for their faith. They must be raised from the dead. So the rapture cannot take place before the great tribulation. It will happen at the end of the great tribulation. But the overcoming saints, even though they live in that time of the great tribulation on the earth, they are under divine protection. Read Revelation 12. Read Psalm 91 and see the divine protection that God has for his people. And God is wanting to prepare his people in the last days, his overcoming church, to be the church that Jesus wants, to be a glorious, spotless, perfect church that's going to warm the heart of Jesus. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's the standard. He wants us to have the same level of holiness, righteousness, sinlessness, perfection that the Father has. I mean, that's the power of the cross. See, we had a sinless humanity in Adam and Eve before the fall. And the power of the cross is to restore that state of perfection, to destroy the power of sin, to restore us back fully into the image of um, of God into the image of Christ, that we might be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And Jesus wants a perfect, glorious, sinless church to be his bride. As we're told in Ephesians chapter 5, 25 to 27, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That is a sinless, glorious, perfect church that Jesus wants as his bride. In Ephesians 5 and verse 32 uh, Paul su uh, summarizes that chapter by saying, this is a great mystery. Yes, it's a, it is a great mystery, the mystery of godliness. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, we see the heart of Paul. He says, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. See, the Apostolic Commission, there's two commissions. There's the Apostolic Commission. That's the commission that God gave to the apostles to raise up the church, to be in the image and likeness of Christ. It's to do with the quality of our relationship with Jesus and the transformation that the power of the gospel does within us to make us like Christ. The Great Commission, the other commission, is on how we can take the gospel to every man, woman and child on the face of the earth. Well, in Colossians chapter 1, 25 to 28, we read about this apostolic commission. 
I have become its servant, says Paul. By the commission, this is that apostolic commission, by the commission, God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery, see this is that mystery of godliness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can't do it by ourselves. Christ has to be in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. You see, we were created right back there in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27. We were created to be in the image and the likeness of God. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. He created them. When we get to the New Testament, no longer does it talk about us being in the image and likeness of God, but it talks about us being in the image of Christ. And that's because Christ is the full expression of the image of God. As it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus came to reveal the Father. That's why he is called the Lord. Jesus came to reveal himself. That's why he was called Jesus. He came to save his people from their sins. He also came to reveal the Holy Spirit and his anointing power. And that's why he was called the Christ, the anointed one. Even in his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, it reveals to us the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. There are three persons, but there is a three-in-one name that reveals a three-in-one God. And so we are to be in the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, we see that we were saved to be like Jesus. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. We're to be conformed to the image of Christ. And the Holy Spirit works progressively to change and transform us into the image of Jesus. To be like Jesus means that we possess his characteristics, his love, his righteousness, his power his anointing, his perfect relationship with the Father, and we share with him in his inheritance and in his glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18, we see that it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that these things come to pass. It says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, perfection is not something that we claim and say, oh, I'm perfect, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a sinless person. No, it's a transforming process of sanctification, of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not by our might, not by our power. It is the power of the Spirit of God working within us, changing us and transforming us. And for that purpose, he gave to us five ministry gifts to help equip the church. The church that Jesus wants needs apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. See, in Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 13, uh, it, it, uh, it tells us some, some wonderful things. He himself gave some to be apostles, 
some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, the fivefold ministries were given not to do all of the work, but to equip the church. The church that Jesus wants is a church where every member of the body is being equipped to fulfill their potential and to be the sort of person that Jesus wants with the gifts and the talents, the ministries that God is dividing up to them within the church. But how long does this go on for? Well, it tells us, it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Apostle John also told us in 1 John chapter 3, 2 to 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God. When are we the children of God? Now. The moment we believed in Jesus, we became the sons and daughters of God. Now we are the children of God. But you know, it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. You know, we, we look on the outside and we, and we still see all of the frailties and the weaknesses of human flesh. But we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul explains to us from verses 16 up to 19, he says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We're already the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Can you believe that? We are joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> there is a condition, though. If indeed we suffer with him, we need to take up the cross, follow Jesus fully, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We wait for that time when the church is going to be unveiled. It's like hatching day. You know, a chicken has sat on those eggs for 21 days. And after 21 days, they all come out, even though she laid the eggs one day at a time. But hatching day is all together. It's, it's, it's also true of the church. We may have been born again, became Christians, you know, some years apart from others. We're not going to become perfect Christians individually by ourselves. It is going to be a corporate event of the whole of the body of Christ in the last days, just prior to the second coming of Christ. And we're going to be changed and transformed and revealed as the sons of God. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, Peter explains it very clearly. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten uh, us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We already are saved, but it's going to be revealed, unveiled, released on the face of the earth in all of its fullness in the last days. So Paul, he begins to reveal to us the impact of this apostolic commission and of the Great Commission. Now, starting in 1 Timothy 3.16, he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. And this is part of our inheritance because we are co-heirs with Christ. 
And because the mystery of godliness is fulfilled within the church at that time, John chapter 14 and verse 12 becomes very real. We often quote this verse and, and a lot of Christians are frustrated because how can we do the same things that Jesus does? Well, we'll be able to do the same things that Jesus does when we become like Jesus. That's why in John 14, 12, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, and Jesus doesn't lie. He's telling the truth. The truth sets you free. Believe the truth. Believe God's word. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. The end time revival will be an awesome demonstration of the power of God. You know, Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead. He fed the 5,000 you know, with five loaves and two fishes. And the church worldwide is going to be demonstrating this same power in the last days, bringing about the great end time revival because the mystery of godliness being consummated within the church. Now, compare what it says in Jeremiah 23 and verse 20. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. You see, in Jeremiah, there were a lot of false prophets prophesying terrible things, telling the people of God that God wouldn't judge them for their evil deeds. And that's why the anger of the Lord would not turn back. You see, he is going to execute and perform the thoughts of his heart. Those things which he has planned from before eternity, he is going to bring to pass. But notice these four points. A, the Lord himself will do this. Don't think it's by your power or your ability. No, the Lord himself will do this. B, his divine purpose will be fulfilled. C, it will be in the last days. And D, God's people will fully understand. Sadly, too many people don't understand the vision of the sort of church and the people that God wants in his church today. But this is what God has said in his word. He's prophesied it from thousands of years ago. In Matthew 13 and verse 39, Jesus said, The harvest is the end of the age. Luke 14, 21 to 23, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled, and it will be filled. In Revelation 7, 9, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues. There is going to be a great revival. There is going to be a global restoration. And today's challenge is do we really want to be like Jesus? Is it our passion to see the Great Commission fulfilled in our generation? Or are we satisfied just to play church? Do we really want to continue to live in the flesh and to continue merrily on the road to Babylon? I hope not. God, God has an awesome plan for us. We want to have a look at this great plan, this awesome plan of the great harvest that is going to come to pass in the last days. The great end time harvest. In Isaiah 19, 20 to 21, it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors and he will send them a savior and a mighty one and he will deliver them then the lord will be known to egypt and the egyptians will know the lord in that day and will make a sacrifice and offering yes they will make a vow uh, to the lord and perform it are you catching this there's going to be a revival in egypt in fact there's going to be a revival throughout the whole of the middle east and in Isaiah 19, 23 to 25, this is expounded even further. 
in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now, Assyria, that's Syria and Iraq, and maybe even Lebanon. The, the kingdom of Assyria was bigger than just Syria, but it, it included Iraq and, and, and Lebanon, and it spread out. And in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt, where you have the Nile River, through to Assyria, where you have the Euphrates. And the Assyrian will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing. Now, notice that this term blessing, in the Bible, the blessing is only in Abraham and through Abraham into Christ. That's why it says in Galatians 3, verses 14 uh, to 16, that the blessing of Abraham came through Christ so that all nations might be set free. And Israel and Egypt and Assyria, worshipping Jesus together in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hand, and Israel, my inheritance. See this map? Here is the land of, uh, of the old Assyrian uh, empire. And there you can see from the areas of uh, you know, of, of, uh, of Babylon, because it included the old Babylonian empire, came under the Assyrian. And there's going to be a highway coming from Assyria down to Egypt, and it will pass through Israel. This is going to be part of the great restoration and revelation and great harvest of souls in the end times. And the Middle East is going to be shaken by the power of God and we are going to see a great, great, great revival. In fact, in countries like Iran, we're beginning to see a great revival beginning to take place. And many Iranians who have fled from Iran have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3, we see this great prophecy of what's going to happen in the last days. And this has a dual application. One, we can see what it means for the church, that the church is going to be filled with the glory of God because the church has been changed and transformed into the image of Christ from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. So in Isaiah 61-3 to it says, Arise, shine. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. See, the glory of God is going to be revealed on his church. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Now today, people are thinking with this COVID pandemic and other pandemics, oh, there's darkness and people are in fear and trembling. They're looking for answers. But the answer is in the church. It's Jesus. And Jesus is filling his church with glory. And there's going to be, in these end times, as the church begins to realize and understand their role and that Jesus wants his church back, when we hand it back to him, let him be the head of the body. We're going to see this come to pass. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Deep darkness, the people. But the Lord will arise over you. Now notice this. And his glory will be seen. It will be visible. It won't be some secret revelation. It will be fully manifest. The glory of God will be seen upon you. And what will happen? The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And at the end of the chapter, in verse 22, it says, the least of you will become a thousand. The smallest, a mighty nation. I am the Lord in its time. I will do this swiftly. Notice these three things. A, the Lord will do this by his power. B, it will be done in God's time. And C, the Lord will do it swiftly. Compare this with Romans chapter 9 and verse 28. This is one of my favorite verses. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. Notice these four points. 
A, the Lord will do this. B, it will be on the earth. C, he will do it swiftly. D, he will do it with finality. And the word there is sun teleo in the Greek from the word teleos, which means perfect. He will do it perfectly. Compare Jeremiah 23, 20. We saw this verse before. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. A, the Lord himself will do this. B, his divine purpose will be fulfilled. C, it will be in the last days. And D, God's people will fully understand. In Revelation 7 and verse 9, I love this. I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now, the Barna Institute did some research. And they did this research based on historical records. I'm, I'm sure it was the Barna Research Group that did this. And they compared, over the centuries, the number of believers to non-believers. And after... 100 years, in AD 100, there was one believer carrying the burden of 360 non-believers, unreached people. By AD 1000, one believer was carrying the burden of 270 unreached people, non-believers. The time of the Reformation in AD 1500, the burden's getting lighter. One person is now carrying the burden of 85 unreached people. In AD 1900, around the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Pentecostal uh, revival, the number of believers to non-believers was 1 to 40. By 1950, this is around the time when Billy Graham began uh, preaching the gospel and many other evangelists began sharing the gospel around the world. And it was one believer to 30 unbelievers. In 1980, at the birth of the AD 2000 movement and the 1040 Windows program, the number of believers to non-believers, the ratio had come down to one believer to every 15 non-believers. I know that the Christian world was said to be one third of the world's population, but they weren't all believers. This is talking about believers to non-believers, one to 15. And at the end of the AD 2000 movement, by AD uh, 2001, it had come down. See, coming down. <laughs> One believer for every seven unbelievers. The gospel has been going forth and has been conquering. And that's why we want to see the Great Commission finished. And that's why we have this challenge before us. Do we really want to be like Jesus? Is it our passion to see the Great Commission fulfilled in our generation? Or are we satisfied to play church and have a fellowship club? Do we really want to live in the flesh and continue merrily on the road to Babylon? Which city are we looking for, Babylon or the New Jerusalem? Remember in Revelation 18, 4 to 5 with Babylon, and the Lord said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out uh, of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. But in Revelation 21, 2 to 3, it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned uh, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Do we want to go to Babylon? Or do we want to go to the New Jerusalem? When we look at the Old Testament, we see that there were two mountains where there was two revelations of God's house. There was Mount Zion and there was Mount Sinai. Sinai is where the law 
came down upon the people because of their rebellion against the word of God. Judgment. 3,000 people were slain um, on that day. In Exodus chapter 32. Or are we seeking for Zion? Where the order of Melchizedek and the kingdom of priests was being manifested. In Hebrews chapter 12, 18 to 19. We're challenged to consider which mountain do we belong to? You have not come to the mountain, that's Mount uh, Sinai, that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest. Hmm. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken anymore. That was a fearsome place. And it says, you have not come to that mountain. But it says, you have come to Mount Zion. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all. To the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Which city? Babylon or the New Jerusalem? Which mountain? Sinai or Zion? God is calling us to be a part of his end time restoration, revival. And Jesus wants his church back. Let's give it back to him. Let's surrender ourselves to the lordship of Jesus. He's the head of the body. We are members of the body, but he wants to take his body unto perfection, filled with the glory of God, filled with the love of Jesus Christ, filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit that will turn this world upside down for the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate these truths to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.